Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Kari and today I'm going to be talking about the 2023 Women's Prize for Fiction shortlist. So this year's winner is going to be announced on Wednesday, June 14th. And what I'm going to be doing today is talking about all six books that were on the shortlist because I've read all of them. I'm going to rank them from my least favorite to my most favorite and then I'm going to take a guess of who I think is going to win because maybe my favorite isn't necessarily the one that I think is going to win. This is actually the first dedicated video I've done for the Women's Prize for Fiction on my channel even though I've been following it for a good few years now. So what I'm going to do first is kind of give you like my background and my history with the Women's Prize for Fiction and then I'll get into the ranking. So if you're not interested in the background of me with the prize, that's totally fine. Use the timestamps below and then you can jump to where I start ranking the shortlist. So I've been following the Women's Prize for Fiction since the 2021 prize season because that's when I started watching Simon Savage or Savage Reads on YouTube. And if you aren't subscribed to Simon, you definitely need to go do that because his videos are great, especially his Women's Prize for Fiction videos. They're amazing. But that's the first time I had ever heard of the Women's Prize for Fiction and I was really intrigued to check it out for myself. So when the long list was announced, I was kind of overwhelmed. You know, this is the first book prize that I'm following and I didn't really know where to start. So I was like, well, I'm gonna find one of the books that I think sounds the most intriguing. And after doing a little bit of research into the full long list, I ended up going out and buying three of the books from the long list. Those three books being Burnt Sugar by Avni Doshi, Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan, and Piranesi by Susanna Clark. So these were the first three books that introduced me to the Women's Prize for Fiction. I actually read Exciting Times first. This became one of my favorite books of all time. I love Nisha Dolan. She just had a new book come out. I'm so excited to read it because of how much I loved Exciting Times. Then I read Piranesi and this is absolutely one of my favorite books of all time. And I actually haven't read Burnt Sugar yet, but I am excited to read it. So like I said, this was my introduction to the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2021. Then when the shortlist was announced, I decided, you know what? I think I'm gonna try to read the entire shortlist. So obviously Piranesi went on to be on the shortlist and I bought all six books that were on the shortlist. I I actually only ended up reading four of the six of these books, which I was really proud of myself because like I said, that was the first time I ever followed a book prize. And so reading four of the six on the shortlist, I was pretty proud of myself. And so the ones I read from the shortlist that year were Piranesi, as I said, it became one of my favorite books of all time. I was so happy when this went on to win. Like imagine my excitement that the first time I ever follow a book prize, my favorite book that I read from the list went on to win. Like <laughs> that was so amazing and like gratifying. I also read No One Is Talking About This which I enjoyed it. It's not one of my favorite books of all time, but I did enjoy it. It was interesting. I read Claire Fuller's Unsettled Ground, which at the time I didn't love it. I mean, it was fine, but I didn't love it. But I still think about this book today. Two years later, I'm still thinking about it. So maybe I should go back and adjust my rating, but this was a pretty good read. I didn't read The Vanishing Half, but I'm absolutely still interested in reading this because I know so many people love this book. So I am still interested in reading this book, even though I didn't at the time. I did read How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House by Sherry Jones. This was a fine book. I enjoyed it in the moment, but it's not a favorite book of all time by any means. And then the second book that I didn't read from the shortlist was Transcendent Kingdom by Yagi Yasi. And I am still interested in reading this one. So like I said, Piranesi did go on to win that year. And this was my history with the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2021, my very first year with the prize. Then the 2022 season came around and I decided again that I would like to try to read the shortlist. So I ended up reading three of the books that were shortlisted that year, plus I DNF'd one. So I did read The Bread the Devil Need by Lisa Allen Agostini. This book was blowing up that year. Everyone was loving it. So my expectations were really high, but I ended up not loving it as much as everyone else did. I read The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. I was really sold about this book because people were saying that it was about a haunted bookstore and I was like, that sounds incredible. Like, I can't wait to read that. The haunted bookstore is like maybe like 15% of the book and it just like totally derails and is not about the bookstore anymore. So I was really disappointed in this book. I think there was a lot of people that were disappointed in this book that year. One that I didn't get around to reading was Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. Now this one is one of the ones that I bought because it was on the short list, but I don't know if I'm still interested in reading it. Obviously I wasn't sold on it when I bought the short list because I never got around to reading it. And now a year later, I really don't see myself picking this one up unless someone really has a strong argument argument that I should read it. So if you've read this and you think I should read it, definitely let me know in the comments. Then the crown jewel of 2022, as you'll know, if you've spent any amount of time on my channel before, was Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. This became an instant favorite book. I love this book so much. I've just been chasing the high of Sorrow and Bliss ever since I read this and trying to find other books that are like it. I love this book so much. I wanted this one to win so badly. I was so sad when it didn't win. But again, similar to 2021, where I walked away with a favorite book 
Duncan Perrin Maisie. In 2022, I walked away with another favorite book in Sorrow and Bliss. Then the book that ended up going on to win in 2022 was Ruth Ozeki's The Book of Form and Emptiness, which I haven't read yet, but I'm very excited to read it. I'm still a thousand percent interested in reading this book. I just haven't gotten around to it yet, but I really do want to read this book. And then if you've been counting, uh, you know which book I DNF'd and it's probably a hot take. I feel like everybody loves this book and that's The Island of Missing Trees by Alif Shafak. I was just really bored and wasn't connecting with the story or the characters and I was like, why am I forcing myself to read this just to read the shortlist and I put it down. If you love this book, I'm very happy for you. Truly, I'm happy for you, but I I, I just I just couldn't and you know it says something that I DNF this because I almost never DNF like almost never so yeah I just didn't love this book as much as everyone else does so again in 2022 Ruth Ozeki won with the book of form and emptiness and I read three of them and DNF'd one but walked away with a favorite book of all time in sorrow and bliss all right, now what we're all here for is the 2023 list. When the long list was announced, I did buy five of the books that were long listed and then two of those five books ended up being shortlisted after that. But the three books that I bought that were long listed but not shortlisted are right here and I've read two of them. I read I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel. This was a really fun, fast paced read. It's written in vignettes so it goes really quickly. And it's about a woman who's having an affair with a married man and she's like obsessed with this married man's other girlfriend. So the man Man has a wife and two girlfriends and she's obsessed with the other girlfriend so it's a fun read I would recommend it the second book from the long list that I read was Children of Paradise by Camilla Gradova this follows a young woman who works in a really old cinema and like the really unique people that work there and how working with these people transforms her I'm not a movie buff but if you are I think you would love this book even more than I did like I couldn't connect to the movie references but I just like the atmosphere of this book the atmosphere was impeccable in this really old almost like spooky cinema, that was a good time. And then the third book that was long listed but I haven't read it yet is Cursed Bread by Sophie McIntosh. I've heard some mixed things about this one but I am still really interested in reading it because it just kind of seems like a my type of book. But what we're all here for is the short list. So these are the six books that were shortlisted this year. And like I said, I'm gonna go through and rank them from my least favorite to my most favorite and then tell you what my prediction is for who's going to win. But first I just wanna give you some general thoughts that I have about these books. And the first one being that there's really similar themes throughout almost all of these books. There's really just one outlier and maybe you can guess what it is in regards to the themes because a lot of these books deal with war or some kind of conflict because we have like the troubles in Ireland and the siege of Sarajevo. We even have like the opioid crisis and the war on poverty in the US and also the war on racism in England in the 80s. Like there's all kinds of different types of conflict basically and also another commonality between almost all of these books except one again is that there are historical fiction. If we can consider the 90s historical fiction, which for the sake of argument, I'm going to consider that historical fiction. So all six of these books kind of fit the theme of conflict and almost all of them are historical fiction except for Pod is not historical fiction. All right, so let's go through these books one by one from my least favorite to my most favorite. So in sixth place with my least favorite book on this list is Trespasses by Louise Kennedy. This takes place during the Troubles in Ireland and it follows a 24 year old protagonist and her name is Kushla. In the in the daytime she's a teacher and at night she works in her family bar and she's been tasked with taking care of her alcoholic mom but also she kind of takes on the responsibility of her young students because some really horrific things are happening to her students families because of the troubles and she kind of takes it upon herself to take care of them at the beginning of the book she falls in love with this older married man named Michael but from the prologue of the book you already know what's gonna happen with Michael and I just absolutely hate that when authors use the prologue to like like spoil their own book. I I just hate that because it really cuts the tension. There was no tension or suspense or anything in this book because you already know how it's going to end. I don't understand that choice when authors do that. I just can't stand it. Also another issue I had with this book and I guess it's not with the book, it's more with me. It's more of a personal thing that I don't know really anything about the troubles. I mean, I know the basics, but I don't know a lot of details and I feel like if I would have known more about the troubles, maybe I could have appreciated this book more. I don't know, maybe, but again, that's on me, not on the book. And kind of in a similar vein, 
Spain, they use a lot of vocabulary that as an American, I'm not familiar with this vocabulary. I don't really know what it means. I mean, I can kind of tell from the context of the sentence, but sometimes it's really not that obvious what they're even talking about. So that just really kept me at a distance from this book that I really am not that educated on the troubles, which again, that's my own fault. And also the fact that the vocabulary sometimes, it kept me at a distance. And also just another little quibble with this book is the fact that there's no quotation marks. And I'm only willing to suffer through that for Sally Rooney. <laughs> so for this book that I was already not enjoying and the fact that there was no quotation marks, it was just insufferable. <laughs> I've already forgotten most of what happens in this book because as soon as I put it down, it was just like gone because I just, I just didn't care what was happening in this book. I felt no connection to the relationship. I didn't really understand why she was so in love with Michael. Like we really don't learn too much about him. So yeah. Trespasses, my least favorite book on the shortlist. The book in fifth position is probably the one that I'm most surprised about. That I thought I would love this book and in the end, I did not enjoy this book and that's the Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. This is historical fiction that takes place in the 1500s, I think it was, and it follows Lucrezia de' Medici. And like I said, I was really excited to read this book because Marie de' Medici was a queen of France that I find really fascinating. And so I thought it'd be fun to read about somebody else from her family, even if it's historical fiction, but it's still like based in fact. And Lucrezia has to marry the Duke of Ferrera after her older sister dies because she was supposed to marry the Duke. And this is not a spoiler, by the way, we know from the very beginning of the book that she has to marry the guy and from page one you know that Lucrezia thinks that the Duke is trying to kill her and so throughout the entire book you're kind of flashing back and forth in time from like her childhood to today to her teenagehood to at the actual dinner where she thinks that the Duke is trying to kill her at this dinner and so I appreciated that the jump back and forth but after I got about halfway through the book I just didn't care anymore it was dragging on so long like this book should have been cut down like by 25% I think it was just way too long and also I didn't feel any suspense or like dread. I really feel like Maggie O'Farrell could have amped it up on the dread aspect. Like this girl thinks her husband's going to kill her. Like I should feel more of a sense of dread and suspense and like, oh my God, what's going to happen? I didn't feel any of that. And it's really a missed opportunity. Also, when it gave you little bits of the mystery throughout the story, it didn't give you enough to want to keep going to like care what's going to happen. Like it was just such small pieces of the mystery that it's like, I don't care anymore. Like you're not pushing me to want to keep reading. So like I said, at about halfway, I was like, I'm done with this book. I mean, I, I finished the whole thing, unfortunately, but it took me so long because I just did not care. So yeah, there's really just not that much plot pushing this story forward. And even though I appreciated the parts of her childhood, I really liked that part. That's what made me get through the first half of the book so quickly because it's about her childhood and I did appreciate those parts. And I love a book that's no plot, just vibes, but this was like no plot, no vibes. I did enjoy kind of like the dark thing that happens at the end, but it was absolutely not worth trying trucking through this entire book for. So in fifth place, I'm putting The Marriage Portrait. In fourth place, I'm putting Fire Rush by Jacqueline Crooks. This takes place during the Jamaican diaspora in London in the 1980s, and it follows Yeme, another 24-year-old protagonist. What is it with these books and 24-year-old women? Because Kushla in Trespasses, she was also 24. And this follows Yeme during relationships, her love of music, her loss, uh, some crime that she gets tangled up in, and her love for her mom pushing her through her day-to-day -day life. Now, you may get into a relationship at the beginning of the book that really is supposed to push the whole narrative forward throughout the rest of the book, but you spend so little time with them in this relationship that personally, I didn't feel connected to the relationship at all. And that really disconnected me from the rest of the story because like I said, the rest of the story really depends on the fact that you care about her relationship. And I just didn't feel connected to it at all. We didn't spend enough time in that relationship, like one-on-one -on -one with them to really like appreciate the relationship that they have. Maybe that sounds kind of vague because I'm trying not to spoil anything, but hopefully you get what I'm trying to say. Also, there's like multiple parts of this book that kind of take place in different places and different times of her life. And I just felt like it was too long. I think it would have been nice if this book was a little bit shorter. I mean, honestly, it's not really that long of a book, but it felt long. Although this is the one book that I listened to on audiobook out of all these books. And I did appreciate the audiobook. If you're interested in this book, I would recommend the audiobook because there's actually music in the audiobook because this book deals a lot with music and Yamei's connection to music and the connection between Yamei and her mom in music and so I really enjoyed the implementation of music throughout this audiobook and also there's like some sound effects that make it really nice so I would
would definitely recommend the audiobook if you're interested in this one. So yeah, in fourth place we have Fire Rush. In my third place position we have Pod by Lillian Paul. First of all, we have to talk about this cover. I'm obsessed with this cover. It's so beautiful. So this book follows multiple sea creatures, but it's mostly from the point of view of a dolphin named Ia. And the whole story is kind of leading up to this spawning that's coming and how all these animals are preparing for this spawning. And it also deals with conflict between different groups of sea creatures and also the dangers that these sea animals encounter because of what humans have done to the ocean. And I especially appreciated these moments where it's dealing with what humans have done to the ocean, how they're destroying the ocean, because the sea creatures really don't understand the existence of humans, that humans exist. And so they're just dealing with the effects of what we've done to the ocean without even thinking like, oh, those stupid humans, look what they've done. No, like they're just dealing with what we've done and trying to survive these horrible conditions that we've imposed onto them. And there's also one character in particular, Google, if you've read this, you know what I'm talking about, that how we use animals for humans benefit without any regard that this is a sentient being. And especially those Google parts like really tore me up because I'm a huge animal lover and like just seeing Google's reaction to the things that he's made to do. I don't know. I, I just really appreciated those parts like that commentary on how humans treat the ocean, how humans treat animals. I really like those parts. And like I said, this whole story is like leading up to this huge spawning in the ocean. And a lot of people who have read this book said that like, oh my God, there's so much sex and so much sexual violence in this book. And I think that that's part of the point of the story is that nature is is violent. And if you took away all of that stuff, it probably wouldn't be an accurate representation of the nature that is being studied here. Obviously, I'm not a marine biologist or anything, so I, I don't know anything about these sea creatures, but I'm just guessing that this is an accurate depiction. I'm assuming Lillian Paul did her research. So personally, I didn't have any problems with those more graphic scenes because it's probably a realistic depiction of what happens in nature. There are times when the perspective jumps around a lot. There were times when I needed to jump back a few paragraphs and read again and be like, okay, whose perspective are we from again? But I did enjoy this book. It's not a new favorite or anything, but I'm glad I read it because a lot of people are talking about it. But yeah, so Pod is going third on my list. In second place, I'm putting Black Butterflies by Priscilla Morris. This takes place during the 1992 siege on Sarajevo, and it follows Zora, whose family escapes to England to kind of wait out the conflict. But Zora wants to stay behind a little bit so she can keep teaching her art classes, and then she's gonna go meet up with her family in England. But of course, the this doesn't happen. She's not able to go meet up with her family in England and she's stuck in Sarajevo. That's not a spoiler, like that's that's the whole point of the book is that she's stuck there. What I really liked about this book is that it's a really interesting depiction of how conflict just happens to normal people and normal people have to figure out how to survive during this conflict and they just have to go on with their normal lives as best as possible despite the fact that bombs are going off and there's snipers in the street and they just have to try to live as normally as possible but how can you? And so Zora is still trying to teach her painting classes while when she goes home at night, she's in an apartment that's been destroyed and how her living conditions continually get worse and worse. So I think that Trespasses and Black Butterflies are probably the most similar books on this shortlist and Black Butterflies does this living through conflict point of view so much better than Trespasses did. I just felt so much more compelled to see what's going to happen to Zora than I did with Kushla. And there's like romantic elements to both of of these stories and I just cared more about the romantic element in this and like the tension that happens between two people in this story I just cared more in Black Butterflies. So I'm putting Black Butterflies in my second position but I have to be transparent with you that I did only give this three stars. We're in spot two <laughs> and I gave this three stars. So that kind of tells you the relationship that I had with this shortlist, that five of the six books were three stars or lower, and some of them were very lower than three stars. So if you've been counting, you'll know that Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver is my number one. Now, before I start talking about Demon Copperhead, I do have to put a little caveat on this and tell you that I haven't finished this book yet. I'm like just over halfway, I think. So that should tell you something that I can confidently with 1000% assurance put this into my number one favorite book spot on this list and I haven't even finished it yet. <laughs> Because no matter how this book ends, I have loved every bit of what I've read so far that nothing is going to make it turn around for me and be like, oh no, actually uh, it's not gonna be my number one. I don't care what happens the rest of the book. I have loved everything that I've read so far 
it could totally tank and I would still put this book in number one. And so yeah, I have only read just over half of this book and I could have rushed through the rest of this book just to have it read before I made this video, but I'm loving this book so much. I'm like savoring every chapter. I'm reading it so slowly because the writing is so beautiful. Like. I just felt like it would have been an injustice to this book to just speed through it just so I could say that I finished it for this video. Like, that's ridiculous. That totally defeats the point of me even reading the shortlist, wanting to read the shortlist. So I hope that you understand my point of view here and forgive me that I didn't 100% finish it. But I, like I said, I'm 1000% sure that this is my favorite book on this list. Even if the rest of the book tanks, I don't care of how much I've loved what I've read so far. It's already a million times better than the other five books on this list. So. With the caveat out of the way, what is Demon Copperhead about? So this book starts in the 90s and it follows a young boy named Damon and obviously he ends up being called Demon. And it follows his struggles of growing up with having a drug addict mom and being in extreme poverty and his life in foster care and how all of these circumstances mix together and how does that affect his life as he grows up. This is a retelling of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, which I've never read David Copperfield and I don't feel like I'm missing anything from this book. Like. If you wouldn't have told me that, I wouldn't have even known that this is based on something else. Like it totally stands alone. But now because of how much I'm loving this book, I am really interested in going and reading David Copperfield sometime in the future and seeing all these like plot points that happen in this book and seeing the original inspiration for those plot points. I think that that would be really fun. And so I did save this book for last because I was the most confident that I was going to at least enjoy this book the most out of the shortlist. But not only am I enjoying this book, I feel fairly certain that this is going to become one of my favorite books of all time, just as Piranesi did in 2021 and Sorrow and Bliss did in 2022. I think this is the book for me that's going to come away as one of my favorite books. So when it comes to the books that I enjoyed the most, my final ranking is as follows. In sixth place, Trespasses by Louise Kennedy. Fifth place, The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. Fourth place, Fire Rush by Jacqueline Crooks. And third place, Pod by Laleen Paul. In second place, Black Butterflies by Priscilla Morris. And then first place, my favorite book that I read for the shortlist was Demon Copperhead by Barbara King Solver. So this is the order that I enjoyed the books in. But do I actually think that Demon Copperhead is going to win the women's prize this year? No. <laughs> Let me explain why. So last month, Demon Copperhead did co-win the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. The other book that won was Trust by Hernan Diaz. So these two books both won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction last month. So because of that, I don't think Demon Copperhead is going to win the Women's Prize. It has gotten so much buzz before any of this prize attention and then to go on to win the Pulitzer this year. I just don't see the Women's Prize giving even more accolades to this book because they're probably like, well, the public already knows that this is an amazing book. Like us giving more attention to this book isn't really going to do anything. So like we should probably pick a different book to like help raise another book to this like stardom level. On the other hand, some people have argued that because Maggie O'Farrell and Barbara Barbara Kingsolver have both already won the Women's Prize for Fiction that they're not going to win again. Like why would the Women's Prize award them a second time? But in my opinion, why would they shortlist two authors that have already won, two of six books from authors that have already won if they weren't willing to award that author again for a second time? Like two books out of the six, that's a huge percentage of the books to just throw away if they weren't willing to award that author a second time. So personally, I don't think that that's an argument against Barbara Kingsolver, I think the biggest argument against Demon Copperhead not winning is because it just won the Pulitzer. So even though I want this one to win, I actually don't think that it will win. I'll be very happy if it does. Absolutely. I'll be so happy because in my opinion, I think it deserves it. And I don't think it's fair if those behind the scenes reasons are why it doesn't win. I just think that the best book should win no matter what, but that's a reality that we have to consider. So I want Demon Copperhead to win. It was my favorite but I don't think it's going to win. So the book that I actually think is going to win is Black Butterflies by Priscilla Morris. Because like I said, historical fiction, conflict period was such a big theme on the shortlist. I think that after Demon Copperhead, this book really embodies those themes the best. So my prediction for the 2023 Women's Prize for Fiction winner is Black Butterflies. So to wrap things up, my overall thoughts on the shortlist are underwhelming. I was really hoping to walk away with multiple favorite books and that just didn't happen. I am happy to have been able to read books that I never would have even heard about if it wasn't for the Women's Prize for Fiction and after all that's the point of reading prize books for me is to discover books that I would never have found out about, never would have picked up. So 
that's a win, even if I didn't walk away with multiple new favorite books. But obviously I am very happy that this prize is the reason that I went and picked up Demon Copperhead and this is going to become one of my favorite books of all time, I'm sure. So I am happy about that. Now just a quick little news segment, update segment. The Women's Prize announced last week that next year they're going to have a Women's Prize for nonfiction. And I am so excited about that. I love to read nonfiction. So I think that that's gonna be really, really fun to add a nonfiction prize to like my prize season mix. But the Women's Prize said that the fiction and nonfiction prizes are going to be running concurrently, I think. So like they're going to announce both long lists at the same time, both short lists at the same time, announce both winners at the same ceremony. And I just think that that's a shame because you know, there's so many people like me who like to pick up these books during the prize season and try to read them before the shortlist is announced or try to read them before the winner is announced and it's really really fun but it's just a lot to put on people I think to put both lists at the same time because you're really limiting people on how much they'll be able to actually read before everything's announced obviously I'm positive that some people will still be able to read you know both long lists I mean wow that's good for these people that's incredible I wish I could do that that's that's amazing I mean just the people who read the entire long list for the women's prize like I'm so envious of these people that they're able to do that like that's amazing I wish I could do that but thinking about people trying to fit in too long lists like I don't know I'm like I said I'm sure people are going to do it but I just feel like it's a shame that they don't separate these two prizes and more people could read more of the books before the winner is announced which is like part of the fun of it you know obviously people read prize books outside of the prize but you know it's like a little game that we like to play as readers but all that to say I am excited about the nonfiction prize and I'm definitely going to be following that next year so yeah this was the 2023 women's prize for fiction shortlist my favorite was demon copperhead my least favorite was trespasses but the book that I think is going to win is black butterflies in the comments below I would love for you to tell me if you read any of the books from the short list any of the books from the long list which ones did you love which ones did you not love and who do you think is going to win I would love to chat with you in the comments about it if you enjoyed this video please give it a like I would really really appreciate it and subscribe if you haven't already I would love to have you back and I'll talk to you again next time bye